Our next speaker is Maria Walsham. Maria is an organizer with the Vancouver Renters Union. Uh, she works as a social worker in the downtown east side and sees the effects of the housing crisis on a daily basis. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Good. So I'm hoping to put Heather Place into a larger context of what's happening with social housing funding in Canada and the specific what's happening to operating agreements. Um, fundamental to understanding the social housing crisis, which is also the same as the general housing crisis, is to see that what's happening in Heather Place, what happened in Little Mountain, what's happening in Lyons Manor, they're not isolated, isolated events, nor are they haphazard. The red thread that connects these geographically spread out sites of crisis together is not the cause uh, of natural developments of the events, rather the result of a long-term strategy to privatize the public sector, to apply the model of the private corporation on all human activities in this case, the non-profit housing sector. Um, the mass exploration of social housing agreements has already begun and will be unfolding further during the next de decade. Uh, this will be compounding on the large, already dire housing crisis and nothing can be more alarming concerning for the underhoused, the precariously housed, the low income and working class population of British Columbia. Yet, this has been kept in the dark. It is underreported and it's not acknowledged by the mainstream press or by the politicians. Um, and in a recent report by BC Nonprofit Housing Association, the expiring agreements were framed as an emerging opportunity. And this is also how it's viewed by neoliberal po politicians. They see this as an innovative challenge for privatizing the public sector. They see here a window of opportunity for disaster capitalism. Which is, of course, when a government regime or corporation takes advantage of a shock, a disaster to the economy, um, to introduce liberal market reforms, which would not otherwise have been introduced. So just to give you a background of what operating agreements are. An operating agreement forms a legal contract between the government and the provider, the housing provider in this case. And they define the parameters for the housing program under which the government is offering sub subsidies or other forms of assistance. They, they take various forms, but the, the, the majority of the operating contracts uh, and the subsidies are linked to the mortgage. That is, the operating agreement is set to expire at the same time that the mortgage is amortized. And the thought behind this is that once the mortgage is paid off, the housing creator should be able to be self-reliant and function without government funding However, recent research as well as recent experiences in the city convey a very different picture. So just to give you a, an idea of the scale and the scope of this pro uh, problem, in BC we have 90% of the 41,000 non-profit housing units are subsidized through ongoing operating agreements with set expiry dates. 80% of these operating agreements are set to expire within the next 25 years, and it has already begun. And I just got actually some data on, uh, on the numbers in Vancouver. <coughs> in Vancouver, this will entail 25,000 expired operating agreements by the year 2030. Um, so this has already begun today. Um, nationwide, we're talking about 99% of all operating agreements with non-profit housing providers will have expired by 2033. <laughs> This amounts to 3.5 billion of reduced government expenditure annually. This is an aggregate withdrawal of approximately 30 billion governmental funds. We're witnessing the unprecedented withdrawal of public housing funds and a massive disappearance of public housing funds, uh, public housing, unless nothing is done about it. Um, so the effects of these uh, uh, expiring operating agreements will depend upon the income and the rental mix of the building. Based on a recent report that looked at um, costs over revenues and whether non-profit housing providers had a, a capital plan to pay for future repairs, uh, the study reached the conclusion that 36% of BC's non-profit stock are in a positive financial state and they'll be able to be viable after the expiry. However, a quarter of the providers are also deemed to be in a vulnerable position and they will most likely not make it unless they get extended funding. 
The remaining 40% are in an indeterminate state, and their survival will depend upon whether they introduce market initiatives, for profit venture, or austerity measures. The providers who are found least likely to be viable post funding today house the highest proportion of low income and precarious households. A 2006 study, um, was case studies, found that the urban native housing project in North, Northeast in Vancouver, 450 units, is among the one of the portfolios which is least likely to be viable after expiring and will not make it unless they get extended funding. The, 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 the same report reaches the conclusion that, that many low-income urban or original households will be displaced and potentially made homeless if nothing is done about it. And I think Patrick is also going to address this later. Um, this dire forecast, the author extends for the majority of urban native housing, as well as the majority of the public housing projects in Canada. And this is because most of them are 100% or at least a very high proportion of rent here to income tenants as well as low income tenants, which means it's a high subsidy. Um, so this is a result of a decade of aggressive austerity measures by the federal liberal, liberal starting in the 1990s. We're now at a historic low point in the federal and provincial affordable and social housing spending. And despite this enormous reduction in government expenditure that these expiring agreements are going to entail, there are presently no federal or provincial plans to initiate new or extend existing operating agreements. The forecasted federal funding for nonprofits in BC year 2030 is zero. So this has been part of a long-term strategy to privatize the public sector in the nonprofit housing sector. One of the strategies used to do this has been to devolve responsibility, to pass the buck down without anyone taking responsibility for it. We have seen the housing, the responsibility for housing being passed down from the federal to the provincial level starting in 1993, but this was finalized in the official transfer in 2006. However, what happens with expiry operation agreements is that the responsibility is downloaded even further. With no plans to extend the subsidies, it is now up to the non-profit housing providers themselves to make their post expiry. And their survival will hinge upon whether they take market reforms or austerity measures to improve their revenues. So what's happened here is the government has been able to shift responsibility while at the same time retaining indirect power through selective and competitive project funding. There's been a shift from core, long-term funding towards time-limited, project-based funding. Um, and I heard this only yesterday, an example of this is the short-term operating agreement that the social housing award has got, which is apparently only 10 years, and which will have to be renewed after 10 years. And who knows what will happen then. So what's happening is that nonprofits are forced to compete for the scarce funding or the contracts uh, that are available, where one nonprofit's gain is another's loss. This means that non-profit funding and the provision infinitely starts in operating like the market. Efficiency and willingness to operate with those in power is rewarded with market power. This has resulted in the growth of large-scale operators, which we can see very visibly in the downtown east side today. This, in combination with the competitive funding mechanisms, has made it more likely that the providers will neglect accountability towards tenants as accountability towards stakeholders is prioritized. Um, Non-profit housing operators are operating now like private corporations, whether by necessity, by force, willingly or not. One minute, please. This means that we have to abandon the idea once and for all that they represent the greater good of the tenants. And we need to organize tenants. And we need to strive for resident control of public housing. In the most extreme cases, responsibility has developed, been devolved onto the tenants themselves. Tenants organizing and opposing what's happening are being blamed for causing problems. An example of this in, in reference to Heather Place is Jeff Meggs recently told the tenants of Heather Place to take some ownership and direction over the future, despite the fact that Heather Place's housing is slated for demolition. They recommended strategies for ensuring future viability by BC Housing, CMHC, and the Nonprofit Housing Associations are nothing less than disaster capitalist measures. They amount to nothing less than privatization strategies. 
and we're witnessing the effects of these measures being used across the city. Nathan mentioned a few of these in regard to Heather Place, and they resulted in evictions, renovations, and displacement. Time, please. Thank you. Uh, can I just finish for 30 seconds? Okay. Um, uh, ultimately, policy recommendations and the practice approach have been focused on finding ways, enforcing ways of nonprofits sustaining themselves outside of an ongoing government structure, regardless of its effects on tenants. And all the viability origins from the Latin word meaning capability of life in the context of expiring operating agreements, its meaning could not be further from its origins. In the context of neoliberal policy making, economic viability violently neglects the viability, the capability of life of social housing tenants and renters in general. Sorry for having such a depressing speak, and I think the others are going to speak uh, what's happening and how people are organizing against this. Thanks very much.